So I hope to demystify that for you tonight and show you that you don't need to rush out and spend a fortune on any special equipment. Um, you could probably find most of what you need in your kitchen uh, right now. And we'll go through that. So this is a picture of uh, Ipamia. It's uh, a non-invasive morning glory um, called Grandpa Ox. And that is one of the reasons to save your own seeds because we are so fortunate we can have access to heritage varieties of beautiful flowers, herbs, vegetables that we may not otherwise um, necessarily be able to access otherwise. And um, it's up to us to keep growing and saving <coughs> Uh, these plants for the future. So um, I got really interested in the subject of plant genetic diversity when I became an addicted gardener. And uh, when I found out, I saw this um, graph here showing the what's happened to the diversity of, let's just focus tonight on food plants uh, mainly. But um, a century ago, at the turn of the last century, um, commercial seed houses were offering hundreds of varieties of different types of vegetables. Um, you know, 408 different varieties of peas and uh, nearly 500 different types of lettuces. So that the gardener had so many choices uh, to, to grow from. And um, in those days that actually most people uh, were involved in their uh, food production. There were uh, market gardens and local farms uh, provided produce for people. And, and we can see at the bottom of this slide, um, 80 years later, the impact of what's happened um, to affect the varieties of food plants that are available to us and how much that has shrunk down um, because people moved away from um, growing their own food and saving seeds and we have an issue now that we rely on so few uh, varieties of um, food plants to feed us and that are commercially available in the supermarket and that's an enormous loss um, so this is what worries me as well. My concern is that we're sitting in a really vulnerable place right now with climate change and climate change affects food production and agricultural crops. And uh, that means that we can't guarantee that we are going to go on, be able to go on importing um, so much of our food from around the world and that it's more important than ever uh, that we um, start growing food for ourselves, which is uh, available locally within reach. Uh, and that we all around the world, in fact, realise with this pandemic that, um, you know, we weren't feeling so secure anymore. And it's, uh, we're into an uncertain future. And it's a very uncertain future because of who controls the seeds. And this um, simply shows quite clearly that the seeds of the food plants are not in the hands of the people anymore. In fact, they're basically under the control. 75% of the world's food seeds are in the corpor under corporate control with just four major corporations um, who actually have the power to decide who eats and who doesn't eat. Um, so I became you know, very motivated uh, with all these factors at play to learn how to save seeds from my garden. And um, there are so many benefits to saving seeds as well because you save so much money. Um, you can have a container full of fresh, uh, vigorous, organically grown uh, food seeds uh, for free when you choose to grow open pollinated varieties of food plants. And so I started focusing on the heritage or open pollinated varieties. And that's what I'm talking about tonight when we talk about saving our own seeds. And I recommend at the very least that people get this little handbook from our national organization called Seeds of Diversity Canada. That is a grassroots seed saving organization uh, where Canadians across the country grow out heritage varieties of food plants, and then they are available 
to other people who join in every year a bulletin is printed and you can join and um, the only requirement is that you in turn save some seeds and offer them back to the organization so that way the people keep growing out the open pollinated food seeds and uh, they're always available um, in the, on a sharing system so that's available at www.seeds.ca if you go online you can also find many many sources for open pollinated seeds if you want to get started so i actually um started saving seeds and i got so hooked on that that i started my own seed business called seeds of victoria and um, they were certified organic and all open pollinated varieties that um, grew successfully in this part um, on Vancouver Island and on the west coast of Canada. So we ended up with, um, you know, I feel a lot more secure about um, food when I know that I have the ability to grow it and I've got the seeds with which to grow it. And I understood that as long as I was choosing open pollinated varieties, that I would always have the seeds that I would need to grow my food in my own yard, in my back garden that I could save for future crops. And so that's the difference between hybrid varieties and open pollinated varieties, which are naturally pollinated. And there are such diversity available to us just here with the pulses, the uh, beans and the peas in this mandala that we made. And a beautiful thing for the children to get involved in, you know, as well, the garden and uh, shucking uh, peas and beans and looking at all the different shapes and colours. And right from the beginning, when I very, very first sowed my first garden from seed, and this is a tiny little pinch of Nicotiana sylvestris seed, it just amazed me the miracle that was within that tiny little speck of dust that held all that intelligence and information to grow from that little speck of dust into this enormous tobacco plant, which is extremely fragrant, uh, called Nicotiana sylvestris. And that in turn, would every flower on that stem would then go on to producing masses of more seeds in continuity in order to preserve the uh, continuation of the species, which is really what life is all about, um, the function that we you know, continue life by reproduction. And um, so I say, if you're going to become a seed saver, then at the very least, um, find a magnifying glass like this one I found in an antique shop and get to know what it is that you're saving so that you are in fact uh, collecting the seed of the plant and not just the chaff by mistake and by viewing it through a magnifying glass you know you can confirm um, they're very small a lot of the seeds that it is that is what that you are after so a hundred years ago when people were actively um, growing huge gardens and providing uh, most of the food that they put on their tables from their own backyards or procuring it locally uh, there would have been a seed cleaning machine like this one uh, where they would have run through many of those varieties um, in order to uh, get clean seed but we don't need uh, all that. We don't need a specialized machine, I discovered. When I got hooked on seed saving, I found that I could just improvise with using whatever was handy and available. So um, tubs and um, plant saucers and baking sheets and uh, uh, beer flat boxes, um, whatever, you know, all works just fine. And when I show this slide, I usually accompany it by saying that one of the um, biggest problems that people have when they're seed saving is that they don't allow the seeds to dry out properly before they store them. And often they'll go moldy in that case because it takes a while for them to dry. And so, you know, this is a very important process of uh, um, seed collection. <clears throat> There's nothing worse 
than going into your container of safe seeds and finding, oh, I'm going to have a quick drink here, that they've gone mouldy. Now, I usually just spread them out in the warmth of the greenhouse, or if you have a warm living room, for example, not in blasting full sun, but um, just for a week or so. And also to let the bugs crawl out um, from during the cleaning process. There's a lot of chaff and plant debris will um, attract bugs and you don't want them crawling out all over your living room. Perhaps use a porch or a greenhouse or somewhere in the garage. <clears throat> And basically what we need, you know, the most technical thing we need, which can be improvised with other things, is a set of screens with different size mesh. So starting with a very fine mesh to a medium to a large. Um, and so the cleaning of the seeds actually is done using screens like this. And the screens can also be used to lay them out in order to dry the seeds. They're very useful um, for that purpose as well as screening. <laughs> when I started out at the beginning, I would literally clean my seeds on a windy day. I would wait for the perfect day. And I would, this is what's called winnowing. I would winnow the seeds by pouring them from one basin to a larger basin with a light breeze blowing that would blow all the chaff off the seeds. And I'd just keep on pouring them back and forth and back and forth until all I was left with was a bowl of clean seeds and all the dust and chaff and debris um, was blown away. Now the other way to do that is simply to blow on the seeds when you get down to the end. Maybe there's just a few little bits left. So you just simply and carefully just blow off the last of the chaff so that your seeds are ready for storing and they're perfectly clean. But over the years and I got busier and I started growing more and more things for my seed business and I realized I couldn't always wait until the perfect day with the perfect breeze. And so I resorted to using a handy hairdryer on a cold setting. And I would just um, screen the seeds and then the last and final cleaning is always done using the hairdryer. And you have to be careful holding the bowl in one hand and moving slightly closer, just starting from a distance until you get just the right distance that you're actually blowing the lighter material out of the bowl. And the seeds that are heavier will stay in the bowl. And you just continue doing that until all that's left in the bowl are the clean seeds. And obviously, you know, a reason to um, grow um, open pollinated plants so for value and for food security um, is, you know, the fact that this is a, a row of kale that was um, planted in like five minutes and left in to go to seed. And out of this uh, 15 foot row of kale, um, leaving it to go to seed, I get a bucket full of kale seeds. And so that kale will go through the winter and then go to seed the following spring. And um, it's a, a brassica and it has a pod. So the seeds are actually contained in the pods and every plant puts out hundreds of pods. And inside every pod, there are 10, 15 seeds. So <laughs> again, and uh, continuation of the uh, species here with the kale. And, um, you know, that way you've got so many kale seeds which have a viability of five years. They will actually last in storage and grow beautiful kale for you for the following five years. Um, and this is all available from a short row of um, kale. Um, just to show you again with something like Tulsi basil, holy basil or sacred basil, which makes a wonderful tea. Um, just we grow these um, in a warm place um, in a one gallon pot. So one plant in a one gallon pot and harvest the leaves. But then finishing them off when they actually go to seed, this is a row of um, Tulsi basil plants on my sun deck. Um, just maturing the seed and you can again I'm showing you this because I want to show you how much seed 
it's like a bush of a bushel here of um, Tulsi basil seeds are available from a few pots of um, basil plants. So, you know, very economic and um, we don't all have to save all the seeds of everything if we just chose to ch save seeds of the best, healthiest plants that produce the most highest yields and were disease resistant. That's the selection that we have as a seed saver. So my garden, again, is um, there's a little bit of thinking to do. There's not much to know about seed saving. It's pretty basic. I'm going to tell you the basic things tonight. But um, one thing you do need to do is practice crop rotation. So this is my 50 by 50 food garden in its beginning stages and uh, simply dividing it into four uh, quadrants and moving plants from different families around, making sure that you never grow the same plant in the same place in following years. That prevents the buildup of pests and diseases. And as a seed saver, you are actually selecting for the seeds from the healthiest, most vibrant examples of the plants from the romaine lettuces that have the biggest hearts on them uh, that are you know of the best flavor and um, represent the variety um, so that the strain is true and um, so in this garden um, I was able to grow enough food amazing amount of year-round food production and also to collect seeds uh, from the food as I was growing it. And admittedly, a seed saving garden doesn't always look the tidiest, but this actually is the part of the life cycle of the plant that most gardeners miss out on. When they don't allow their plants to go to seed, then you don't see the final stage of the plant and the color of the flowers and you know the fantastic shapes and forms uh, of the plant when it's finished, it, it's going from seed back to seed. And um, it's amazing, you know, how many different types of seeds you can save from a relatively small space, as long as you understand about what uh, crosses and what doesn't cross and what you can grow close together and what needs separation. So, for example, in one quadrant of my food garden, I would plant rows and rows of salad greens, um, all the different lettuces, because lettuce is a good place to start as a seed saver, because lettuce is self-pollinating. And self-pollinating basically means that the male and female are in the same flower, that the plants have what's called perfect flowers with male and female in the same flower. They don't need an agent like a bee or a pollinating insect to or wind to conduct pollination because they basically are self-pollinating. And because of that, there is less chance of them mixing up their genes with other varieties. So when it comes to lettuces and salad greens, you can actually grow um, plants relatively close together and be sure that you are going to have purity of strain with the resulting seeds. So that's what it looks like later on in the year when the lettuces have been allowed to go to seed. So in a, in a row like that, what we're doing is we're harvesting lettuces as leaves, leaving the plants to grow on. Um, some of them we're thinning out to leave some of them to get larger. Then we are selecting out our best lettuces um, and eating the rest. And then we've got the seed of the best lettuces, which is uh, going to be grown for the following year. And so, you know, you want to be able to select for the, the best traits that the plant offers. And in this case, um, the plants are just growing side by side and are keeping them upright so they don't touch each other and that way when the lettuces go to seed which looks like this and they're in the asteraceae family used to be called compositae um, they are have these little parachutes little feathery um, um, attachments to every seed 
because they're wind pollinated. The daisy family is wind pollinated. And so waiting for dispersal, waiting for the wind to come along, pick up the parachute of feathery parts and blow the seed away from the mother plant to disperse it. And at this point, as a seed saver, you can say that seed is ready and cut it off and put it in brown paper bags. And so brown paper bags, when you go to the grocery store, I'll have um, paper, please. And um, during seed saving season and in they go, you write on the bag, the variety, the date collected, any pertinent notes that you want to make. And you just um, leave it in the bag for it to dry and the seeds to drop in the bag. So they don't actually mature and drop in the garden. Um, this with the lettuce, when it's ready, when it's dried, then um, lay it out and then the separation occurs, which is a banging. It's just a, actually taking bundles like a bouquet of flowers of the lettuce and bashing it against the slope of a wheelbarrow, a cleaned out wheelbarrow, and the seeds will fall off the plant into the bottom of the wheelbarrow. And then the next thing is to take your screens and actually um, look at your seeds, decide which screen that the seeds will go through and that the chaff and debris will not go through. So you can start your first screening into a clean, dry bowl. And at the end of that screening, when you finally you've got only a little bit of maybe sand or just a mostly um, removed large chaff debris, um, plant material and you've just got the seeds and you just need to give it the final cleaning you gear up with your um, hair dryer <laughs> and blow off that last remaining um, debris from the seeds and ready to package and store away and um, seeds store best at five degrees centigrade they just need to be in a cool dark place in airtight tubs and so something like yogurt tubs works perfectly for that um, there's the chaff just blowing off the seed there and there is the clean lettuce seed um, ready to store away seeds are never actually dormant um, they're always breathing um, and exchanging gases and so what happens over time is that the seed loses its um, what's called viability its life force and the vigor and so that means that the older your seed is, the less vigor it will display when it's um, sown for germination. And so sometimes it's a good idea to do a germination test, um, just uh, putting 10 seeds on some paper towel and seeing how many out of the 10 germinate to show you um, whether you need to sow extras for poor germination or not, or even whether to determine whether there is any germination left or whether the seed has exceeded its um, viability. Um, with pea seeds, um, you know, it's a really good trick. The gutter trick works like magic for me every year. And I just put potting medium in uh, the um, gutter. And so the pea seeds one inch deep, one inch apart, you know, throughout the gutter. And another thing for a seed saver to start saving, which is very easy, are peas because peas and beans, the same as lettuces, are self-pollinating. And so you can grow different varieties relatively close together without worrying about them cross-pollinating. So we take these variety of peas in the gutter, we'd um, hoe a row, we would uh, just put the supports in place, hoe a furrow, slide the peas out of the gutter, put them in the furrow and let them grow up the supports. And um, that way you get 100% germination, you avoid birds pulling them out, you avoid slugs eating them, you don't have to reseed. Um, you just put them in, when they're about four to six inches tall in the gutters, they're ready and the roots are ready to go into the furrow in the garden. And um, this is the most successful way to get the largest yield and success out of your peas. And um, at this point, we're actually um, in this picture, um, we've got sweet peas and edible um, pod peas growing together, so they won't cross with each other. 
And at some point, the more you pick them, the more they produce. And at some point, you can just stop picking them and let the rest go to seed. And this picture shows like, OK, we're, they're maturing now and uh, the pods are going crispy and uh, the seeds inside are ready for saving. And you can do the squish test if you're not sure whether the seeds are ready or not by just um, seeing if they're soft or they're still green or if they're hard. And um, if they resist when you press them, then they're ready for collection. With the peas, there is something to consider and that is um, pea weevils. And um, if you look closely, when you save your pea seeds, you can pull out any that have been infested uh, by weevils. They will have eggs um, laid inside them. And you can see them quite clearly because they're cracked open and the egg masses are showing and you want to discard those. And then in case we missed any, we always put the pea seeds in the freezer just overnight to kill any other uh, insects that might still be lurking in the seed and to guarantee that we've got um, bug free seed. Um, with the rest of the seeds, the only other um, seed that I usually um, freeze uh, is hollyhock seeds. Hollyhock seeds have weevils and um, they love living in the um, seed case of the hollyhocks. And so if you save hollyhock seeds um, and you just spread them out on a plate, you'll see that there are a lot of little weevils are going to show up. Um, so I let the weevils crawl off the seeds by leaving them out, spreading them out on a tray. And then just to be sure, um, I put them in the freezer for 24 hours to destroy any other weevils. But that's the only time that I actually would um, freeze seeds. Um, so that's the mammoth melting seed, um, you know, very generous, also makes a good soup pea, mammoth melting. Um, and you can get um, a really high yields using the um, gutter, the pea gutter trick. And so here in a small space in my 50 by 50 garden, I've got crimson flowered broad beans and um, kale going to seed there, and actually some perpetual spinach. There's a lot of things going to seed um, in a small space. And the crimson flowered broad beans are a wonderful example of um, a woman called Miss Cutbush from Kent in England had been saving these um, crimson flowered, very fragrant fava beans um, in her garden for years. And now she was in her 90s. And so she donated a handful of these seeds to the um, Henry Doubleday Research Association Seed Library that then went on to have um, the seed exchange as we do with the um, Seeds of Diversity Canada in England. It's called Henry Doubleday Research Association. And um, I was able to apply to their um, program and get a small packet of these crimson flowered ball beans and we've been growing these every year ever since and they make wonderful um, uh, favas which can be dried or can be frozen and um, also beautiful plants in the garden with the benefit of um, lovely colour and fragrance and in fact a lot of people don't know this but originally um, these um, crimson favas date back to 1778 and that sort of is an illustration of how our ancestors have been passing seeds on from generation to generation um, for, you know, food security and uh, knowing that they uh, will grow well and produce um, lots of high protein beans. Uh, so if that bean was not saved uh, by Miss Cutbush, um, over all those years and then donated, that would probably be an extinct bean now. But that bean actually, it came to Canada and it went to the CD Saturday seed exchange shows that um, travel across Canada. There's 150 CD Saturday seed exchanges in Canada um, where people who save seeds go every year and exchange their seeds. Because of that, it's in circulation and uh, you'll always be able to find somebody that is growing out the crimson fava beans. 
And um, so beans and peas, as I said before, are self-pollinating. You can grow many different varieties. You don't have to worry about cross-pollination. Um, usually 30 feet for the pole beans is plenty to guarantee that there's no accidental pollination. And you can enjoy saving um, these um, blue jay um, heritage um, beans, so many different uh, wonderful snap beans and also dried beans. And the tomatoes, fortunately, um, are also self-pollinating. So that means that we can grow lots of different varieties of tomatoes available. There are hundreds um, from all around the world. And if you go to um, www.seeds.ca, you'll be able to find um, people who are growing them and supplying them. Um, these are the heritage tomatoes. Um, often with colourful histories and stories behind them that hail from all over the world and everyone is bound to find their favourite <laughs> um, tomato amongst such a selection as this and I certainly got carried away because uh, at one point I was actually growing over 50 varieties at my nursery and um, people just loved the choices uh, and the um, diversity amongst the heritage tomatoes but um, again, only six feet spacing between tomato plants and the same with peppers, you know, the um, Solanaceae, that is um, eggplant, pepper and tomatoes are all able to be grown uh, within close distance to each other. And um, it's very easy to save seeds of the peppers. Um, you just have to cut them in half and scrape out the seeds um, if you are collecting seeds of hot peppers like habanero, scotch bonnet or cayenne, you probably want to wear a pair of gloves and uh, not to rub your eyes until you take your gloves off because um, they're extremely hot, the seeds is where the heat is. You take the placenta out of the pepper um, and then you can either freeze, the peppers freeze really well um, or make um, some hot sauce with it or some maybe red pepper jelly if they're sweet peppers and um, save the seeds to grow out the following year. And this is just one week's worth of collecting from our pepper plants, um, just to show the diversity that's available. Um, and they're heat lovers peppers, but um, you can grow them in two gallon pots, one pepper per plant, uh, per pot, and um, put them inside um, the greenhouse or um, put them up against, a, uh, up on a sun deck or something like that to get an extra heat eggplants the same um, and that you can um, grow wonderful eggplants surprisingly these rosa bianca white eggplants are quite prolific um, in two gallon pots and again um, with minimal separation between plants and how do you save tomato seeds actually so the thing about saving seeds is you always want to be able to be um, identifying what it is you're saving so you want to have a label that's uh, going uh, with the seeds as you're saving them. When you cut the tomato in half, you'll see the seeds there and the pulp. And if you look closely at the seeds, you'll see that actually there's this um, gelatinous coat around every seed, like uh, there is egg white around egg yolk. And that gelatinous coating is there to inhibit germination. And so the idea is that we actually want to ferment the tomato seeds, which at the same time as dissolving that gelatinous coating, it also destroys any seedborne pathogens at the same time. And so um, you want to squeeze that out um, with the liquid of the tomato um, and the label handy and literally leave it for four days to ferment, at which point you'll get this kind of scum forming on the top. Um, and on the fifth day, no more than um, five days, because the seeds will actually germinate if left any longer, um, you want to take um, that and put it into a big bowl. Um, the good seeds are going to sink down to the bottom of the bowl and the um, scum and the seeds that uh, are no good will float up to the top of the bowl. And you just pour that off and you repeat that. You keep on filling it up with water, let the good seeds sink to the bottom and all the scum to the top, 
pour it off. And finally, at the very end, you get a, a sieve out from the kitchen and you pour the seeds into the sieve and rinse them. And then you tap them out, um, get them off the sieve onto a plate, spread them out with the label and leave them to dry in a warm place for about a week or so. And then crumble them with your fingers because they are kind of clumped together and let them dry another day or two and then store them in an airtight yogurt container with a label on top. So this is one week's worth of um, tomato collection for seed saving. And um, we've got them picked at the peak of ripeness when they're red. And, um, you know, they are um, definitely, it's important not to pick them too early when the seeds are still green and immature because then they won't um, <clears throat> grow for you the following year. And uh, that is the preferred way to um, save tomato seeds. And so this is what it looks like when you're growing lots of different types of tomatoes. I just used to squeeze them into yogurt tubs. And then this is actually an interesting photo because it shows you all the different types of bacteria and microbes that are come um, and at work at the fermentation process. Uh, it's really interesting. Everyone is different. So they all get eventually rinsed off and sieved and tapped and dried. And so you end up with plates full of seeds like this, which are labelled and ready to be stored. And a, a tomato seed will actually be good for up to 10 years um, if stored in a cool, dry place. Um, and uh, the germination at the 10th year isn't the best, of course, but you still can get that seed to germinate, which gives you an opportunity to um, get the seed back if you uh, think that you've lost it. That's um, you know, a wet process, and this is also a wet process of seed saving, where mostly um, saving seeds involves drying. Um, in some cases, the seeds actually are part of the flesh of the fruit, um, as this is with um, ground cherries and cape gooseberries and tomatillos. And so in this case, I put them in a food processor or add some water and just mash them with a potato masher. But the idea is that you want to macerate them. So these are purple tomatillos. And again, you can't pick the seeds or squeeze the seeds out of these. You have to macerate the flesh to release the seed that's embedded in the flesh. And so a processor with a pulse um, and you put the seeds in and you just give it uh, three or four pulses, very little, because you don't want to, you know, destroy the small seeds. And that um, breaks up the flesh and releases the seed. And then you can put it into a bowl of water and have um, the seeds again will sink to the bottom and then strain out all the um, pulp. Same with cucumbers, really important if you're saving seeds of cucumbers. Um, they um, need to be mature within the plant and left to yellow, um, almost go yellow. So um, they're going to get large and you want to leave them for as long as you can on the plant. Because um, if you pick them too soon, the seeds won't be mature inside the cucumber. And uh, when they're ready, you can just scrape the seeds out of the cucumber into water. And again, the good seeds will sink to the bottom and the empty seeds um, or the no good seeds will float to the top with the pulp. And again, rinse out so that you end up just with um, good quality uh, plump cucumber seeds. And it's amazing how many seeds a cucumber makes. Um, we grew Armenian cucumbers this year and they were just phenomenal. Uh, that was an interesting um, uh, vegetable to try. So um, I just went over the self-pollinating food plants like the lettuces, the peas, the beans, the tomatoes, the peppers and the eggplants. And those things can all be grown in relative um, close proximity to each other. But then now we're going to be talking about cross pollinating plants, uh, outcrossing plants that actually 
have the male and female on different plants and that's all the squash family and the squash family have flowers that are either male and this is a male flower with a long stalk and pollen on the anthers and also has a female flower with a short stalk and and there's an ovary and a stigma and the female and um, what has to happen is that the pollen has to be transferred from the male flower to the female flower in order to enact pollination. And when that happens, then the flower withers as the fruit develops um, and the uh, fruit comes out of the dying flower um, from the ovary of the, of the flower. So, um, the problem is you actually have to uh, make sure that you don't have more um, the one variety from every species there are four different species of squash plants which is why i recommend you getting that handbook that i talked about it costs 15 dollars from seeds of diversity they'll mail them out um, you can order on their website at seeds.ca um, because it explains about hand pollinating, controlled hand pollination, um, and also um, about isolation. So um, if you're growing uh, two different types of uh, Curcubita pipo, then they're going to cross with each other and you won't get uh, the uh, purity of strain when you sow the seeds that result in the following year. So that's important to make sure that you have isolation and you choose maybe only one variety from each of the four species. And that is possible to do that so you don't have to worry about outcrossing with the genetic material. And often, you know, people are so excited because they get volunteer squash in their garden and they're on their compost pile or wherever and they grow them out and they look and they go, what is that? And um, that usually is an unedible inedible squash that is the result of a cross between um, two different varieties um, and you get neither this nor that and something which isn't really worth eating so um, yes isolation and selection when you're choosing to do a save squash seeds or practice hand pollination and taping after you've actually uh, done the hand pollination um, the other ones uh, which are trickier to save seed from are um, biennial root crops like the celeriac. Um, not so much for us here on the West Coast because we have such mild temperate winters and um, things like beets and carrots and celeriac and rutabagas will actually overwinter and then we'll go to seed the following year because they're biennial root crops. And so getting them through the winter in other parts of the country, people would have to dig them up uh, because they probably freeze and then they have to um, store them and then replant them the following year in order for them to complete their life cycle. But for us, we're lucky. Uh, we can actually leave them all winter in the garden. And, um, and that goes for onions. So all the alliums are biennial root crops too. And alliums will easily cross with each other. So you have to be careful again uh, when you're choosing to save onion seed. They need a quarter of a mile um, isolation between varieties to maintain the purity of the strain. Um, these are chives and um, they are um, easier to collect seeds of. The uh, flowers blossoms are um, edible and um, they produce lots of seeds within their seed heads which are easy to um, collect and um, shake out. Um, the leeks are also um, very easy to collect seeds of. They, it's a bit of an investment, they take time. Um, if you're choosing leeks to save seeds of, you want to choose winter overwintering varieties that can last through the winter because then they will go to seed in the following spring. And um, this is actually something which even if you don't eat the leeks, you know, you can <laughs> just, you don't like leeks. You can grow them just for the seed because they're like ornamental. They are so showy. And um, I just love them when they come up and start going to seed the following year. And um, they've got these huge um, 
purpley pink um, seed heads on them. And within every seed head, there are hundreds of little inflorescences. Um, they attract lots of bees and pollinators to the garden because every single one of those has to be uh, germinated, uh, not germinated, pollinated, um, fertilized um, by a bee in order for a seed to result. And the thing about allium seed is that they are very short lived allium seeds and they need to be fresh and you need to save them every year for the best results. So um, I enjoy this spectacle in my garden. I enjoy the bees and the pollinators that they attract to the garden. And I certainly um, appreciate the buckets full of black leek seeds that um, I get as a result um, of allowing them to set seed like this. But it is a slow process for the seed to mature. Um, and usually you wouldn't be collecting them till maybe July or no, maybe somewhere between July to August. Uh, no, not August. Um, sorry, <laughs> September. Yeah, um, I've had to wait till September. Um, uh, maybe it depends on the weather, how quickly you know seed sets and matures. But in an average year, probably you're going to be waiting until September before you're going to be cutting down um, the heads with all the seeds in of your leeks. And then you want to, to um, dry them. I just leave them on the bench in the greenhouse to let them thoroughly dry. And then I take a pair of scissors and I cut um, the seeds off the top of their stalks and into a stainless steel bowl. And then I just take um, a pair of gloves and I rub uh, the seeds out of the chaff to separate it. And then use the hairdryer to blow all the bits off, all the uh, debris leaving me just with pure black leek seed. And the same with the um, sunflowers will cross up as well. You know, for years we uh, just grew this one sunflower. Um, it's the Tarahumara sunflower, which is an edible um, sunflower seed. And they're huge. They're the size of dinner plates. And you only get one. It's like the Russian mammoth sunflower. You only get one flower per stalk and the stalks are gigantic. Um, and so we wanted to have edible sunflower seeds, so we made sure we didn't grow any other sunflowers because they would cross pollinate. You need about a quarter of a mile. Um, so it's a bit difficult in the city to collect sunflower seeds, but then maybe we don't care and we let them mix up and we just have a mix of sunflowers the following year and we let the birds have some too. But um, when the head drops, usually the head follows the sun round during the day. And um, when the seeds are ready, um, the head will bow. And um, that tells you that now it's ready that the seeds are actually, um, the petals will have, uh, the first indication it's the petals fall off the flowers. And then in the center, the seeds are formed so there'll be different sizes and um, it's like a spiral of seeds inside each head so then we'll cut a, a foot of stalk off the sunflower and we'll just line them up in the greenhouse facing the sun again to dry them out before we actually just pick out the seeds from the head of the sunflower into a onto a screen and um, thoroughly dry them Window screens are worth collecting if you're a seed saver for drying purposes. And um, yeah, there's some wonderful sunflower seeds there for eating, but also for growing more sunflowers the following year. Just to warn you as a seed saver that um, some things you have to watch out for because there's seed all over the garden, like this uh, Good King Henry is an example, and they produce millions of seeds, as does um, Arugula sylveta, the wild species of Arugula. And um, you want to make sure as a seed saver that you're on it and you're actually not allowing them to seed around the garden because it can be a real nuisance to get rid of these plants everywhere. And um, when you dry them out, they, um, they've been dried in a brown paper bag and now we're going to strip them off the stalk. Um, this is a good King Henry. It's a perennial spinach plant. And um, we're going to actually screen it. So the next thing is we're screening the seed through a very fine screen because it's tiny, tiny seed. And we're uh, separating all the um, chaff from the seed. 
And um, at the end of the cleaning process, um, when we've used the hairdryer, uh, we should just have a bowl full of clean um, seeds to sow for the following year. And coriander is another one um, that um, is um, easy to let go to seed. Um, it's a half hardy annual. It um, will produce seed in the first year in the garden. And um, it's a wonderful plant to let go to seed because the simple flowers of the coriander plant attract pollinators and beneficials to the garden uh, because of the simple flower structure. And then after that, they are so generous in their seed production. And uh, when the seeds change color from green to this sort of pinky brown, it tells you that it's time to collect them. And again, just to cut them off and uh, put them in, um, you know, totes or into buckets or into brown paper bags. And um, then later on to um, shake them off and separate them from the plant. Um, a small uh, row of this um, celebration Swiss chard, which is multicolored, is fun to save seeds of this. Um, this will go right through the winter. It's pretty winter hardy, it's fantastic food and um, easy to save seeds of. And it's the fun because you can uh, get to select the colors of the stalks, the most vibrant colors, so you can get your own mix going there. And uh, this is what it looks like, a short row of celebration Swiss chard produces masses of um, chard seeds. And it's in the Chenopodiaceae family, which is the beet family and Swiss chard. Um, and um, the seeds look like this. Um, they're hard when you press them. Um, they're sort of shifting color. They've gone from green to yellow and from yellow they will go to brown. And with some plants you can actually take the seed um, off the plant um, before it's fully mature as long as it's reached a certain point of maturity. Um, and you get to know this through experience. It will continue to ripen off the plant. And so this seed will, um, over time, we've laid it out on tarps because we've got such a large quantity here. Um, when it's brown and dry and ready, we'll then strip the stalks and release the seed um, and screen it. Um, and it, that is a close up of um, the chard. Um, so you can see that it's brown there and it's a little multiple seed, <clears throat> um, composite seed. And, uh, there's lots of seeds available for future chard harvests. And with something like radishes, um, they um, produce pods and also really pretty flowers, either white or pink. And um, the pods are also edible and they're very ornamental. So in many cases, I say just plant some radishes in your flower beds or some leeks even, or some of that colorful chard and then eat your garden, you know, like don't separate it out, like you can plant food in all over the place. So um, this is radish seed, like we've laid it out, just shows you um, how much seed is, fantastic quantities of seed from a, a relatively short row of radishes. And um, so some of the ways to release the seeds from the um, plant is um, just a tapping in a tote, simple light tapping, and crushes the plants. This is flax. And so tap, tap, tap and out the, the seeds um, will come and fall to the bottom of the uh, tote. And then you just take off the plant um, chaff and um, start with the screening and uh, finish with the hair drying. And um, in some cases, um, it's a little bit, uh, you've got to get a bit more violent than that. <laughs> it takes um, a sledgehammer um, at, with the artichokes or the cardoons, they're rel related. Um, you have to wait until they ripen. And um, this is what you get as a result. These beautiful, huge um, purple thistle flowers, very ornamental and the bees love them. And uh, when they are mature, um, it looks like this, you cut them off the plant and then, you know, you want to put them in a stainless steel bowl and take a hammer or some kind of crushing implement and um, release, break it up and release all the feathers from the um, artichoke. And uh, at the bottom of every feather is a seed attached. 
And so again, this is in the family where, a thistle family where the wind is the dispersal agent and it picks up the feathers and blows the seeds away from the mother plant. And so with this sort of um, uh, preparation of this seed, it's advisable not to breathe in the dust and to wear gloves because it's prickly and um, also to um, not do it outside on a windy day <laughs> um, and to screen off all this stuff because the seeds are rather small and they'll just drop through a screen. It's quite easy to clean. And when you clean, you actually end up with um, a tray of plants that look like seeds that look like this. So when I wrote my book, The Zero Mile Diet, um, I wasn't just writing a book about growing food. Um, I was writing a book about um, um, ongoing food harvests and year round uh, food production, winter vegetables. Um, and also um, for every single plant that I talk about, and um, I actually give directions from the A to Z of vegetables and the A to Z of uh, culinary herbs. Um, I, I explain how to um, grow them, their cultivation requirements and little things I've learned over 35 years of growing my own food. But for every single plant, I also talk about how to save seeds because to my mind, they belong together. You can't have sustainable food production without having the seeds with which to grow the food. Um, I started out saying that and I'm extremely concerned um, about the fact that, you know, we've moved so far away from gardens, from growing our own food, um, from uh, the incredible rewarding experience of doing that but also the empowerment of choosing to grow open pollinated heritage varieties which thanks to our ancestors and uh, networks of seed savers across the country are still available to us um, more and more of us now have gone back to the food garden and I know that next year it'll be the same as last year. There'll be a mass panic of um, trying to get food seeds with which to grow food. And uh, one has to remember that this is not just happening here around us. This is happening concurrently around the entire globe. In every country, people are concerned just as we are um, about food security and what's going to happen because of the impacts of climate change and what's going to happen to the distribution and availability of food that we've sort of take for granted because of COVID impacts. Um, and, you know, now is as good a time as any, and you probably did this year go back to your food garden to um, learn how to save seeds because then the people will have control of the seeds. They'll be back in their hands and we will be actively growing out the seeds that we save, which is really the only way to ensure their continuity. Because um, even with that seed vault in the tundra, which is now melted um, in Norway, uh, where the whole world sent seed collections for storage for future generations, um, I just don't think that that's the solution to our problems because in a hundred years, you know, if we access those seed collections, what kind of um, environment and what kind of world, um, the changes are so fast. We need the seeds grown out in our gardens um, and adapting to change as change happens, as the weather shifts, so do the um, characteristics and traits within the plants and we need access to seeds of those food plants that can survive the impacts of climate change and are completely adapted to our microclimate and also actually your own unique microclimate in your own backyard and so once again i say that the best seeds you can possibly grow from are the seeds that you save yourself they're the freshest um, they're the purest because, you know, you probably tended them lovingly and grew them organically and um, they are going to yield amazing results for you. And uh, in the past, I've compared our own seeds with some commercial varieties 
um, most seed companies don't actually grow their own seeds, they just package them. And uh, we found that our seeds are 30% uh, bigger, larger, the endosperm is more vigorous, and we get amazing results. So uh, I'm going to finish now and encourage you to become a seed saver. <laughs> Thank you. What a beautiful, that's a beautiful message. Thank you. Very inspiring. Um, Caroline, there, there are a few questions in the Q&A, so um, I will um, open that up and go to those. So um, Jillian is asking, is it too late to put the peas in the freezer after being dried? In other words, you know, she's put them in the freezer to kill the weevils. And oh, yeah. uh, is it too late? Too late to do what? To put the peas in the freezer. Um, okay. Be dried. Okay, so she's collected the pea seeds, she's dried the pea seeds, and now the next thing is to select any that have got any cracks or egg masses yeah. and get yeah. rid of them. You've done that. And now to take your airtight container and put it in the freezer and then take it out and store them in a cold, dark place. No, okay. it's not too late. Okay. At any point, you can freeze those seeds, yeah. Great, that's great, good. Um, and Amber is asking, can I put the seeds in the fridge? I, she has sort of two, or she has a two-part question. She says, can I put the seeds in the fridge? And the second part is, my lettuces are still in its yellow flower been like that for quite a long time and no fluffy cotton things forming why is that thanks okay all right so probably at this stage of the game you're not going to get mature seed from your lettuces they're still in flower and the sun's disappeared it's cold and it's wet and they probably are not going to um they're not ready yet to be saved so the timing on that unfortunately is just you've just missed it um, uh, another example on our farm is that we've got Italian parsley, which is beautiful seed, but it's all green seed. And I'm going to trust that it'll overwinter and um, hope that it'll go on to mature its seed next spring if it makes it through the winter. I don't think you can, if you don't need the space, leave your lettuce um, probably it's going to rot with all the wet though. So I think at that point, I can't be too encouraging. Mm -hmm. And what was the other question? There was a two part question. Um, so she just wonders if she can put her seeds in the fridge. Oh yes, okay. Yes, you can put your seeds in the fridge. Um, you don't actually need to put your seeds in the fridge. The best temperature for storage is five degrees centigrade. Um, the, the thing about putting them in the fridge is that um, you want to make sure they've got silica crystals in with them to absorb any moisture and that you, um, the most dangerous thing about freezing or refrigerating seeds is that when you open the container, that the warm air rushes in, cold seeds, condensation, moisture reintroduced mm. to the seeds. Um, really important to how you open the container and um, how you allow, make sure that those seeds um, <clears throat> are not damp at all when they're restored. Um, the only reason really to store seeds in the freezer is, you know, if you wanted to extend their shelf life uh, because it stops their, um, the breathing I talked about, the seeds, you know, gas in, gas out all the time, um, very slow, um, never fully dormant. Um, but um, if you freeze them, that halts that process. So it does extend the, um, the, the viability rate of the seeds. But again, you have to be really careful about um, uh, how you, um, uh, you're making sure that they stay dry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so apparently there is a seed library in South Surrey and they're wondering about crimson fava beans. Yeah. And if they can get some for their okay. library. Oh, yes, I'd love to. Well, we have some. We saved lots of seeds this year and uh, we grew them out. So, um, yeah, if you want to connect them to my address, I can mail them some. Okay, okay, I can send that out. Sure. And the only other thing is if they can find them online, um, that you can go to seeds.ca and see if somebody. Um, is um, listing them in their seed catalogue. 
So seeds.ca has a sort of like it's like a seed swap, Scott. Yes, it's the website for Seeds of Diversity okay. Canada and actually all the seed savers who are contributing seeds back, they get listed in their yearly booklet, um, and which if you're a member, you can join and then you can request all these different seeds from them. Um, so, um, you know, that's one way of getting the crimson flower broad beans. I'm sure somebody's growing them out in Canada. Um, the other thing is they have a wonderful resource list of all the seed companies, the little small, the few that are remaining, um, that actually have open pollinated seeds. And so you can actually then get hold of their listings and catalogs and you can order all sorts of interesting things um, to start out with. Yeah, okay. that's great. That's a great resource to know about. Um, so Linda is... Um, first of all, she says fabulous information, so she's obviously enjoying the talk, and she wondered about my first year collecting seeds from my deck container garden. How can one be assured of getting seeds that are non-GMO, or do we just have to rely on the packaging? Yes, oh, well, most seeds are not GMO. There are certain things that you should be aware of, like corn, for example. Um, and it should be listed in the catalogue if, if they're GM. Mostly, um, like West Coast seeds, for example, they don't have any uh, GM seeds listed. And they'll say that right there on the catalogue. So, um, yeah, they um, most, it's not a big concern about that for the home grower. It's uh, more of the um, things like the soy um, and the corn. Um, and canola, it's more uh, a commercial application for the mm. farmer, which is where the seeds are genetically modified um, to assist in the application of herbicides, uh, mostly Roundup, they go together. Um, or the corn is Bacillus thuringiensis resistant so that they can use those chemicals in production. But that is something that is not really of concern to the home gardener. So it'll be hybrids like basically you look out in the listings for OP, which stands for open pollinated. Um, if it's described as heritage, that generally means it's open pollinated. If it has F1 written by it, and most seeds are F1 nowadays, hybrid. You can't save seeds from them, um, but it will tell you in the catalog that it's a hybrid, an F1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, huh. Um, I'm just gonna move over to the chat because there were some questions in there. Um, Judy's asking, how long are sunflower seeds viable for? Oh yeah. Yes, yeah, so I guess they've got quite a bit of oil in them. Again, um, probably good for about five years if they're stored in a cool, dark place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and you, do, you can easily, easily do a germination test with sunflower seeds too, because um, mm -hmm. you just have to literally soak them in water overnight and lay them on a paper towel because they germinate really fast. And you just take 10 seeds actually and do that. And it'll tell you straight away how many out of 10, you know, what the um, germination looks like. Okay. 10 out of 10, bingo. You know, every right. single one is good. Um, three out of 10, only 30% germination, mm -hmm. not so good. <laughs> you, you know, you're going to have to sow a lot more than you want in order to get the number that you want. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then final question from Sally, where can you get silica crystals? Oh, um, any pharmacist or a hardware store, you can probably uh, get silica crystals. Um, can you remind us what uh, those were used for? I forget. Um, that uh, you put that with your seeds in order to stop them getting wet to keep them dry. Right, right. A, a reassurance. Um, you know, when you get like, if you buy a new purse or something, it, often it has a little sachet yeah, in it. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, it's that <laughs> silica. Okay, great. Dampness. Wow, wow. So I was curious, um, when you, obviously you're not saving everything for seed because you need to eat some of your produce. So approximately what percentage of your crop is, is you save and let go to seed? Yes, and you know, that's a very good um, question because in my book I actually li um, outline um, the required number of plants in order to um, have the pollination. 
um, and get um, seeds from the plant, you have to grow a certain number. So it could be like a minimum of six kale plants for genetic diversity or you know you've got it like a lot more plants um for other varieties of, of food um so yeah that is actually listed you can get that information um in a seed saving um book okay, and it would tell you okay. in the, the seed how to save your own seeds handbook i showed you and also i actually list that in my book as well i tell you you know that you have to have a minimum of 30 plants or whatever mm. in order to have um optimal genetic diversity yeah okay okay good wow lots of information it's fantastic thank you so much um, fun also too. you mentioned the zero mile uh, i know you have two books which is zero mile diet and one is a cookbook but the other yeah. one is the gardening one which talks about is that still in print Yes, oh, it is. It's some um, available on. Well, I hate to send people to Amazon, but <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a Harbor Publishing, right? It's Harbor. Yes, that's right. And yes, it's still. In fact, it sold very well this year. You know, for obvious reasons, because people yeah. want to know how okay. to. Okay. Okay. Well, and I suppose you know, we you might be able to order it from your local bookstore. Thirty two. Yes. Oh, yeah, yes. You didn't want to <laughs> go to Amazon. We do have a copy at the library if if people want. Yes. To. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. That's great to know. It's still available for people. That's great. Well, gosh, thank you so much, Carolyn. This has been really, really interesting and actually kind of a perfect um, talk to end our series about seed saving. I mean, it's just the right time of year. There've been lots of lovely uh, comments in the chat, which I oh, can that's really nice. see. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you so much. And um, okay. yeah, enjoy the rest of the fall. Um, I hope that you, um, save lots of seeds <laughs> <laughs> yes to everybody yeah okay yeah. And thanks everybody for coming um it's been really fun to do this this gardening series and send me an email if you have some other ideas for for um webinars you'd like great okay thanks a lot carolyn thank you for inviting me you're welcome bye-bye good night bye -bye. everyone night <laughs>